Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the virtual village hall, I suppose. Um, well, I'm, I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about wildlife and about how to bring the wild into your gardens. My name is Megan McCubbin and I am a zoologist and um, wildlife TV presenter. Um, I've been presenting now for a couple of years and I've been kind of engaged with wildlife my entire life. I've loved it since I was a little girl, started out with, you know, looking through the undergrowth for all kinds of insects and mammals and anything that I could find. Um, and then since developed into a more scientific career, I went and studied zoology at university, um, studied lots of different places around the world with lots of different animals. I specialised in predatory behaviour, uh, the illegal wildlife trade, and have since come back and really focused on wildlife right here at home, which I have to say, you know what, it's, it's pretty good. It's very good. I'm very excited by it. And I um, yeah, I've totally fallen in love with all kind of flora and fauna within the UK, which is fantastic. I'm a little bit burnt out there by the background, sorry. I had a bit of a technical difficulty, so the place where I would normally be outside, which is all nice and green and lovely, um, it, the, the connection isn't quite reaching there, so I've had to um, quickly run inside. So I hope that's okay, oh, all okay. Um, so I'm gonna ask, uh, answer a few questions that have been sent in over the course of the last 24 hours since we were posting about doing this live um, to and just talk about how we can encourage wildlife back into our gardens because of course in lockdown we were all really disconnected of course it was a really hard time and facing now uh, potentially you know the second well the second wave is coming and or is already here I should say um, you know looking forward about how we can connect with wildlife and make it kind of part of our homes too because it really does have so many mental health benefits for us. We know that if we spend at least two hours a day, um, or two hours a week, sorry, outside, then it has lasting impacts on our mental health. And that's because of the way that our brains interact with bacteria in the soil, bacteria in the air, that really does just boost our mood and make us happier. And it's the way that we see light coming in in all these different ways and reacting and bouncing off different surfaces, different textures, particularly shapes that are symmetrical. Our brains really react well to that and we get this huge boost of serotonin and makes us incredibly happy. And that's something that I think many of us connected with over the course of lockdown. We suddenly were turning for comfort within our own gardens. And in doing so, we got incredibly connected to one another as well as the wildlife on our own doorstep. Because beforehand, you know, we might have walked past a, a flower or a species every single day and not given it any notice or any attention whatsoever because it's just something that's been there the whole time. But because of lockdown, we went outside and we looked at things differently. We engaged with things differently. And that is really incredible because we've seen the extraordinary in the ordinary. And we have kind of, well, for me personally, it was the the first time that I've been in one place for an entire spring. Um, I was in the New Forest, which is where I live. Um, and I got to be in the same space and watch the season change, watch it develop and see and get to know the animals around me. Um, which was absolutely amazing, you know, it really brought a lot of comfort in a time which was really, really quite difficult. Um, so now, you know, we know that we've connected with it more than ever. It's been there for us. Now we really do need to turn around and be there for it because much of our wildlife is in decline and struggling. So uh, what I'm going to do is we're going to go through a couple of the questions that have already been sent in. But of course, this is live. I do have your comments coming up. Hi, Anne Booth. I'm glad that you're looking forward to this. <laughs> uh, I will keep up, I'll keep checking those comments. So um, make sure that you do send them in. And if any live questions come up, anything that you want to uh, chuck at me, I'll do my very, very best to answer as sufficiently and best that I can. I've got a couple of book recommendations as well, which are really cool if you're interested in how to kind of rewild your garden. Um, so um, let's get started, I suppose. Uh, the first question is from Julie Parmenta. Um, is it okay to leave pumpkins out after Halloween? Well, yes, yes, it is okay, but you do have to be incredibly careful. So you want to look at your pump after you've got done your gorgeous carving and put it somewhere and um, scared all the neighbourhood children or sweets or trick or treat or whatever you've done with it to celebrate Halloween. Um, then take it inside. Make sure there is no candles left inside it if there's any wax and that can be quite harmful to wildlife um but of course at this time in autumn food stocks are depleting you know there's no berries the shrubs aren't quite as 
uh, juicy as they once were, so food is more limited. So it is really good that we can give our local wildlife a bit of a boost. But what you really need to do, because if you have cut, you know, smiley faces and googly eyes in your pumpkin, then animals can get inside that and get trapped. So what you need to do is cut it up into pieces. If you're planning on feeding it to small, uh, small mammals, things like uh, foxes will take it, badgers will take it, and of course small rodents as well. So it's really, really good nutritional source for them. So what you can do is cut it up into squares and scatter it around. Obviously scatter it at a place where the animals aren't going to come in and get too habituated to you. Uh, that would be fantastic. But of course every part of that pumpkin is a really valuable resource. So all those gorgeous seeds in there, it can make a really tasty snack for people. I've heard there's a really cool recipe where you can spice it with spices and roast it for a little bit. And apparently it's really nice, but I've not tried it. Maybe I will do this year. Um, but what you can do, of course, birds love the seeds. So all you need to do is dry those seeds out. They take about 10 minutes in the oven, mix them around a bit. Uh, and then they can go out and hang in your bird feeders or be scattered across. Of course, because of the size of the pumpkin seeds, they're pretty large. They will mainly uh, attract or be eaten by the larger birds. So if you would like um, to, you know, offer the same kind of nutrition to your smaller birds too, which I would really recommend. It's a bit more of a fiddly job though. Uh, make sure you cut those seeds in half a little bit and then spread them all out. And that's a, a fantastic way to make sure that all the species in your garden are benefiting from your pumpkin. You can also make a pumpkin bird feeder, hanging bird feeder. If you haven't put, you know, a, a smiley face in your um, in your pumpkin, what you can do is put holes about this, this, this side, that I suppose about I don't know, uh, two centimetres in diameter, stuff it full of bird seed, put sticks all the way through your pumpkin. So if you remember that game where you had to put sticks in the plastic holder and you pulled it out with the marbles? It's a bit like that, I suppose. Put sticks all the way through so it comes out at both ends. Put all the, mar uh, the I was about to say marbles, don't put marbles inside. But put lots of bird feed inside and then hang your pumpkin from a tree and then you'll see the birds hopefully come and perch on those sticks and then they'll be able to take the seeds from the holes as well. So that's a really cool thing to do. Pumpkin's valuable resource, absolutely use it. Don't just chuck it away in the compost bin because we get millions of them chucked away and it is, um, it's a sad thing because it would be really valuable to our wildlife. Uh, so next one is from Steve Carter. Can you put food out for young foxes? This is a, I guess, a bit of a personal preference. Some people prefer not to. I personally do. It's something I've always done. I put food out all the time for the foxes that live down the lane from me. Um, and especially important at this time of year, because as you say, those cubs have grown up. Um, a little bit they're still juvenile so a little bit of extra support can really really go a long way but I think the key there is always consistency so if you're able to do it make sure you can continue to do it um, and it's a really nice thing to do particularly if you're like me or uh, my stepdad Chris Packham and not very good at cooking and there seems to be a bit of leftover because foxes are incredibly generalist feeders they will feed on everything and anything <laughs> that they can that they can obviously depending on their environment we've got urban and rural foxes um so yeah we feed them you know the moldy stuff at the back of the fridge it's got a bit off but everything because it all can be used and they've got really strong stomachs so they're able to take it uh but they need to with chris's cooking anyway but don't tell him i said that um uh so yeah absolutely um, I, I personally do and I, I find it really great because I can sit at a safe distance back and I get to know my foxes and that for me is a really amazing time of the year when the cubs start to come out and I can sit further back initially they'll know you know they might know that I'm there because they've got really keen noses so they'll be able to smell me but after after a period of time they get used to to me kind of being far back and when I say far back I'm probably a good I don't know 15 20 meters with a pair of binoculars and um they kind of play around and have fun and they kind of, every time we come out, they know what time it is and they'll be scuttling around in the undergrowth, but they won't show themselves until we're far enough back that they feel comfortable to come out and indulge in their new feast of, I don't know, old food and uh, what else do we give them? We give them dog food, actually. We give them kind of dry kibble, which is really good for them. So uh, a mixture of that as well. So yes, I personally do feed my foxes, but there we go. Um, Catherine Pabla, uh, how to encourage hedgehogs into the garden? This is a really important one. I love this one because hedgehogs are in serious decline. We've lost the vast majority of our hedgehog population in the last 50 years. Um, we used to get them all the time around the house in the New Forest and I have to say I haven't seen one there in about the last 10 years, which is um, 
devastating, really, really devastating, because they're actually Britain's favourite mammal. We love our hedgehogs, they're um, very, very close to us, and um, so we need to give them all the help that they can possibly get. So to encourage hedgehogs into your garden, what I'd say is the most important thing to do, because it's what's what's causing their decline is um, a lack of habitat, habitat destruction and fragmentation. Habitat fragmentation is when we've got this gorgeous landscape of rich habitat, which is perfect for all kinds of animals, and we put roads, we put fences, we put everything up across it and we block it out. So wildlife is unable to move across those barriers, it's unable to go over the top of those fences or under the fences um, and is unable to disperse to find resources, to find mates. So this is something called island biogeography, so that you create these pockets of islands where habitats, become, uh, where populations become incredibly vulnerable. Um, which is one of the big things for hedgehogs is that they simply can't move around. So one thing you can do, and I'm a big advocate for, is hedgehog highways. They're really, really easy to do. All you have to do is put quite a small hole at the bottom of your fence. The exact dimensions are about 15 centimetres wide and about 13 centimetres high. So it's not very long whatsoever. Um, it's a tiny little hole. And then you can get hedgehogs coming through. And if you're... Um, gates are raised, your um, your fences are raised, then just put a little ramp um, on, the, on the side of the hedgehog highway and they're quite good climbers, hedgehogs surprisingly, really good climbers. So you'll, um, you, and also a great thing to do there is also get a camera trap to see if you have enticed any hedgehogs in, a uh, little camera trap so you can buy them quite inexpensively actually and you can see what amazing wildlife you've got at the bottom of your garden. I had someone uh, doing some work today who said that they bought a camera trap and they were finding foxes and mice, and it was just lovely for their young children. So uh, a camera trap's a great way to engage with the wildlife in your garden. Um, but of course, it's not brilliant if you're the only one doing it and you have got a hedgehog highway. Of course, it's better than not having a hedgehog highway. But what you want to go and do is knock on your neighbour's door, start a conversation with them and say, hey, do you know about the plight of hedgehogs? Do you know about their decline? Any chance you could put a hedgehog highway in your fence across? And then you hopefully get a whole street doing it, which is an amazing thing when communities are able to talk to each other, talk about conservation. And most of the time, you know, I, well, I've done this quite a lot. I've, one of the projects for my little brother, who's 12, was to I asked him to go and check with the neighbours and get everyone to put hedgehog highways. And I have to say he was really successful. And um, the uh, Wildlife Trust, the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust, um, have been doing something similar. They've been going and creating this initiative called Wilder Streets, Portsmouth. And um, in Portsmouth, there are these nominated streets which have all come together as a community. And they've done some incredible things. They've all got this, sh they share seeds with one another, hedgehog highways. They're making this kind of green stretch. Um, and they're hoping that this is a, a plan that can be rolled out throughout the UK in many major cities. Portsmouth is the second most densely populated city in the UK. So it's really important that we can encourage wildlife in there too. And they're doing a fantastic job at it. And one way you can do that is hedgehog highway. So that's really cool. You can also put a uh, frog and toad highway in. If you like your amphibians, I personally do as well, but I would suggest making just a hedgehog highway because then frogs and toads will fit through anyway. But um, if you want to make a, a frog and toad highway, then the dimensions are eight centimetres wide and about six centimetres high. So that would be quite cool. If you've got a little pond, which is also a fantastic addition to any garden, is a freshwater pond because we've lost most of our freshwater systems from the UK. And just by adding a little bit of pond, research shows that it dramatically increases the amount of biodiversity that you can see in your garden because the birds will come in, they'll drink, they'll wash, there'll be amphibians, you know, you have your toads, you'll have newts, your frogs, you'll have your, um, you know, hedgehogs coming in to drink, your mammals coming in to drink, your damselflies, butterflies. Um, it's a really fantastic little hub and a great place for learning and for mental health as well because we know that people really enjoy being by the water. So that is something that is a really, really great thing to do. But of course, if you want to encourage hedgehogs more, you can put in kind of a hedgehog house. And this is a brilliant year to do that because hedgehogs are, of course, looking to hibernate over the winter time. So if you can get your hedgehog houses in ASAP, that would be fantastic. Uh, it can be a little box, even just a bucket on its side will do perfectly. And what you want to do is put a bit of substrate down so that the hedgehog can get nestled in there. Um, so what you want to do is like some nice hay or some straw, uh, right, right in there, tuck it in quite heavily and the hedgehog will come in and nestle in. Also a little food tray of wet cat food actually works really well. And um, if you're using slug repellent, then um, that is really, really detrimental to 
hedgehogs. So hold back on the stealth repellent. Um, so that's one, that's a few ways that you can get hedgehogs into your garden. Fingers crossed that you can see them. I really hope you're able to. Um, they are a fantastic little animal that really adds so much to our biodiversity. Uh, on to the next one then, um, Helen Wyman. Um, she can see tawny owl, uh, hear tawny owl, sorry, at night in the paddock close by. What are the chances of seeing them during the day? Well, you'd have to be quite lucky, I think, to see them during the day. They are quite rarely spotted uh, in, in the daytime, but it's not impossible. It does happen, particularly if you're going out at dawn and dusk. That's kind of particularly at dusk, actually, because sometimes they are uh, early risers or early for them anyway. Uh, and you will see them kind of on the ground, which is actually where they can feed. So don't always look to the sky. Do sometimes look to the ground because they can be feeding on the ground. Um, I, it's tricky, really, seeing tawny owls. I, I hear a lot of them uh, where I live. We think we've got about 20,000 pairs of tawny owls in the UK. They're the most common owls that we see. Um, and they are, I have to say, the most charismatic little things. I helped hand rear a tawny owl once, and I um, I had to sleep on the on the sofa in the living room, which is the owls, where the owl was staying as well. And I have to say, never share a living room with an owl at night. No, that was a mistake. Didn't get much sleep, but it was an amazing experience. And uh, yeah, he was a great little. He's called he's called Darwin. He was a, a rescue, and he used to sit on the shower curtain as you were taking a shower. It was quite quite a lovely little thing. Um, but tawny owls are fantastic, and of course you can hear them in autumn and winter. The males start twitting, and the females start qu quitting. Um, so when you hear that kind of duet, that twit twit, it's actually the male and the female. Um, the male goes first, and the female responds with what's called a contact call to let him know that she's there. Um, and they kind of do this kind of duet together, which is what you'll be hearing in the paddock, which is an amazing thing to see. Uh, during the daytime, they are kind of nestled in cavities. They really like deciduous, thick woodland. So they are, And they are incredibly well camouflaged, very well camouflaged. So do go out and look, have a, have a look through. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, if you do get to see it, that would be fantastic. But um, during the day, it is harder. So I'd suggest going out at dusk, I think. It's probably the best chance to see them. Um, Emily Thompson, how to save bees? Uh, and this is actually a similar question by Toby Cowell as well, who said how to save bees and butterflies. So I'll, uh, I'll do them both together. Um, so butterfly, uh, let's, go, let's go bees first, shall we? Of course, we all know that bees are incredibly important animals for pollination. We rely on them so heavily for our own crop production. It's really important that we can kind of safeguard the future of bees um, and wasps as well. And I know not, not a lot of people like wasps. You hear the buzzing and you instantly go into panic mode. But I have to say they are equally important pollinators as bees, equally important. Um, so we do need our wasps as well. But anyway, what can we do to attract bees? Now, of course, it is all about what you plant in your garden. And I'd always recommend planting native species if you can, native species that have always been in the UK. That's because all the animals that evolved here will have specialised adaptations in order to use those plants as a resource. So the proboscis bit that comes out of the mouth of the bee to, uh, to, to collect the pollen will be specifically adapted to certain UK native plants. So it's almost like a puzzle. If you bring in other species, it's not quite going to fit with the species that we've got and often can cause conflict and problems. So I'd always recommend getting native species if you can. The things that I've got in my garden that the bees absolutely love is lavender. They really, really love lavender. So if you can get lavender in, it's great, um, especially because it's it smells really good as well. And I don't know if you've got dogs, but dogs like rolling in it and they come in and they. it's not like, you know, when they go out and roll in badger poo or fox poo, they come in smelling of lavender and it is lovely. So I really recommend lavender. The bees absolutely love it. The other things that you can get are thistles as well. Thistles are great. You've got foxglove, hawthorn and um, alliums as well. Alliums are really, really good for bees. Um, there's been some really interesting research done in the last year where scientists actually noticed um, with with bees that uh, if you look at the plant, sometimes if, if, a, if a bee, a social bee species emerges early, then what they'll do is they'll come and they will damage the plant. And what that damage will look like is almost a half crescent moon shape. Um, and that actually causes flowering plants to flower earlier. And what they think, because they tried doing it themselves and creating these half moon patterns in the plants, but the plants didn't flower any earlier when it was human made and only when it was um, done by bees. And what they think is that there might be some kind of chemical in the bee saliva 
that actually causes the stress response of the flower to open up earlier because if the flower can feels like it's in threat it will fl open up earlier so that it can reproduce earlier and get all that pollen out there so that it can um, survive essentially if it feels like it's going to be eaten or destroyed or some kind of climatic change that might threaten its survival for that year they'll open up earlier and reproduce earlier so that's a really cool thing that we've just found out about bees again it's finding those extraordinary things in the ordinary that we see every day um, and this could have you know really important implications when it comes to research for climate change as well so there's that going on which is really exciting i'm excited to see what happens uh butterflies as well buddleia yeah, they love Buddleia. I had so many painted ladies on my Buddleia this year, I can't even tell you. It was covered in them. Absolutely lots of them. So Buddleia is a really, really good one as well. And of course, any wild flowers you can bring in, if you can have a wild flower patch, excellent. It's a really exciting thing to do. My favourite thing is to go and sit out by my wild flower patch because it makes me feel happy. All the different colours and everything. Oxide daisies are beautiful. Um, all these kind of beautiful poppies and native species that you can get in in these mixes and it's really low maintenance actually it looks beautiful and it doesn't take too much work you only have to kind of mow it uh, once a year potentially twice a year depending on how you'd like to manage it um, and also the sowing is quite simple as well so we'll get we can talk a little bit more about that in a minute uh, what other questions have we got we've got one oh this is also from Toby Cow what's my favorite animal that is a tricky one I'd say um, I, I do really like my predatory, I quite like hyenas, hyenas are a really good one, if I had to say, uh, or sharks, I'm a real big shark fanatic, I've worked with sharks, I've researched them, I did a project on shark personality, which was really amazing to find out that, um, well I helped a, a friend with her PhD work, um, and she found that um, sharks do have these different personalities, juvenile lemon sharks, and they actually will choose which they're kind of quite social in their young stages when they're in the mangroves because the mangroves provide them protection from larger sharks um, and they will be quite social with one another and they will actually kind of choose to swim next to sharks with similar personality traits so they're essentially choosing who's more um, suited to them which is actually really fascinating um so on to uh, i've had to choose a uk species though i'd hmm i would say do you know what? i might go hedgehog or a fox. You know what, it's really tricky. I love it all. I really do. It's tricky. Or maybe a bird of some kind. A goshawk is pretty cool. Goshawks are quite great. From Formidable predators, goshawks. Absolutely amazing. Um, let's go on to uh, Leslie Mitchell-Moore because I'll start rambling and go off on a tangent again. I do that too often. <laughs> so, um, how can you create kind of a, a mini wild hedge in the garden? Um, lots of different things really. You can use kind of hazel or English yew. Again, I try and use native species uh, to do that as well. Um, and they, hedges are, of course, really important because they're something called a biological corridor. So um, the hedgerows across the UK are fundamental. Um, they were once, of course, used just to mark la uh, land boundaries by uh, for agriculture or ownership. Um, and now we know that they are really important, like I mentioned earlier, with those fragmented ha uh, habitats where you've got those islands of habitat, having something, a hedgerow, that links them up is really, really important because it allows the animals to safely move from one to the other. Um, so if you can put hedges in, I really do recommend it and, uh, and kind of help build those up. Nice thick hedges, really good, of course, for all kinds of animals. You know, nesting birds will really love it. Um, you know, you'll have hedgehogs in the undergrowth, you'll have insects, everything. Um, so that's something I'd really, really recommend doing. Um, why are pigeons multicoloured? Now, this is an interesting one and with quite a complex answer. Um, it's, it's all due to the expression of three very specific genes. And I think um, the question was getting at not why are they multicoloured on the neck. If you know that they've got, if you look at a pigeon, they've got that iridescent kind of purple blue tones in their neck. Um, this is more kind of why do you see pigeons, some that are grey, some that are brown, and some that are whiter. Um, and it's all to do with these three gene expressions. And the way that these three genes interact with one another basically um, is kind of like coding for the pigmentation on the feathers. Um, so basically, there's obviously every animal on earth gets its coloration from a, a compound called melanin. Um, and there's two different types of melanin. You've got eumelanin and you've got pheomelanin. So eumelanin is 
responsible for the kind of the black brown pigmentation that you see and then you've got pheomelanin which is responsible for the red and yellow tones and it's the combination of the two which determines the coloration of the animal and there are kind of exceptions of this because you can get genetic mutations of course um, like for example in badgers you can get um, erysthetic, leucistic, albino badges, all this kind of stuff. So it's a, just basically variation in the genetics of the animal. Um, interestingly though, if you see crows, an animal which is typically jet black all over, if you see crows with kind of white blotches on them, it actually indicates that they've eaten too much human junk food. They've eaten too much fat and sugar in their diet at a young age, and that has changed the pigmentation in their feathers as adults. So that's um, a fact that I learnt this summer that really blew my mind, actually. Uh, crows eating junk food, changing the black pigmentation on their feathers, but really quite cool. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to have a look at some of your uh, comments that are coming in. If you have any questions for me, um, just let me know. Put them in now and I'll, I'll get round to them. Uh, thank you for the pumpkin advice. You're very welcome. I hope it's useful. Uh, I, hope, I hope you do try pumpkin bird feeders. If you do, take a photo of it and um, maybe comment it somewhere in the virtu virtual village hall, it'd be fantastic to see those, So, or send them to me directly, it'd be fantastic. Um, uh, I just love crows, do you have an opinion on them Megan? This is from Veronica, absolutely, I love crows, they are so highly intelligent, um, you know, we know there's lots of intelligent studies have been done on them, I'm really fascinated by the mind of animals, the psychology of animals, and how they think, and how they work, and how um, intelligence evolved. And I think crows are a fantastic species to study um, because they demonstrate, you know, problem solving, critical thinking, uh, self awareness. In some cases, it's really they're really fascinating. When you sit and watch a crow, and you you know it's working out something. Um, one thing to do with crows, if you'd like to do your own back garden experiment, you should uh, you should you should try it out. There's lots of different kind of things that you could do. You could almost um, what did we do recently? We got these kind of tubes and we filled them with water and pebbles and a treat and the crow worked out that it had to put more pebbles in to lift the water table to get the treat so that was quite a good one but there's lots of little things that you can do and um to kind of figure out and great thing to do with kids as well um really great to kind of help engage them with wildlife because it is so so important at a young age because i think every young person has that innate curiosity of all kinds of life around them and it's really important to capture that um, and allow them to kind of go and do, uh, do, you know, get in amongst nature, put your noses in there and feel around and see things, pick things up and look at things and of course be safe, um, but really engage with it because that's when you kind of ignite this lifetime passion and we need, you know, more conservationists now than we ever have done. Um, you know, I, I always say that I'm an environmental activist as well. And a lot of people kind of turn off when they hear the A word, the activist word. But I don't think that's something that we should be doing. I think we should be challenging that word, challenging perceptions around that word. Because if you have listened to this uh, live stream, then my argument would be that you're an activist as well, because you're active in your environmental community. You're passionate about it, hopefully. Um, and if you put bird feeders up, if you put, uh, I don't know, a pumpkin bird feeder, if you go out and make a hedgehog highway, then you've done something active for wildlife. Um, so we really need to kind of re-challenge that word because activism is what it means to you and you can do it in your own way, at your own scale. And I think every kind of step forward needs to be celebrated. And if we can wake up every day and do something a little bit differently, then it's going to be really beneficial for all. It doesn't take you know, you don't have to you don't have to be kind of an extreme activist if you don't want to be, but it's always really good to be active in your environment and make your gardens as wild as possible. And um, speaking of that, I wanted to um, get to my book recommendations for, for today. This one, I have to say, is a brilliant book. This was sent to me by uh, Francis Tophill, um, Rewild Your Garden. It's a really beautiful book. You can see here all of the kind of illustrations. We've got this gorgeous uh, newt on the side here. Uh, and a nice orchid there. What we're going to do though, there's a bit at the back that I thought I would um, quickly go through because it was really important. Um, because it's all about uh, what you can do in spring and autumn and winter uh, for wildlife. But uh, the, the piece that was marking that page has just fallen out. 
So there we go, I've got it. So here's what you can do for autumn, which is of course what we're heading into, well, what we're into now, the gorgeous colours of the trees, it's beautiful, isn't it? My favourite season. Um, so what you can do for wildlife at this time of year, pile up your leaves, um, rather than burn or bin them, um, organisms like bacteria, fungi and insects will inhabit the pile of leaves and thrive there. Um, once those leaves have been consumed, it's really great and lightweight compost, which is perfect for your garden soil. So if you can, pile up those leaves, let the decomposers do their thing and you'll be left with some great soil. Uh, place any nest box that you might want to put up. Place them now, it's quite a good idea uh, because of course birds aren't nesting at the moment, it's not breeding season naturally, birds are kind of recovering from quite a hectic spring and summer rearing their young. So what you can do is if you go and put up those nest boxes now, then those animals will hopefully get acclimatised to those boxes. And when you put things up, it kind of gets covered in your human smell. And some animals are quite sensitive to that. So if you're able to put it up earlier, then it's less kind of human smelly. So um, it's a, kind of always a benefit to do that as early as you can in the season. You don't have to. Um, obviously, you can still put up bird feeders and they still will be highly successful later on. Um, but if you can do it now, it's quite a good thing to do so that they can get acclimatised to that new object in their environment. Um, plant any bulbs you have, uh, which is a good one. Um, you can obviously create hedgehog houses, which is what we were talking about earlier, uh, and fill it up with leaves and twigs and just place it somewhere strategically in the garden that's not too, um, not too close to where you are all the time, somewhere a little bit hidden and a little bit sheltered. Uh, and if you are really kind of interested and want to see whether you do have a hedgehog in there, rather than kind of looking in and disturbing the animal, which can be really detrimental to it, really recommend getting a camera trap. It's a really great way to see the wildlife that you've got in your garden. Um, and this is a really good one as well. Of course, when we're talking about planting uh, for your garden, it's really, really cool to have species that are going to flower all year round. Don't just focus on the spring and the summer, but focus on the autumn and the winter too. So a couple that you could get now are the barefoot perennials and trees, uh, which are perfect for winter planting. Um, and continue to feed your birds. Yeah, it's a really hard time for them at the moment. They've, uh, you know, they've gone through one of the most stressful times of the year. They're only very, very small, some of them, you know, our little robins that are here all year round. Um, you know, and they'll be singing, the robins will be singing, both male and female will sing, um, obviously very characteristic of winter and Christmas. Um, but it's a great thing just to kind of continue feeding them, provide that extra support. You lose that pumpkin, just make sure you cut it up and make sure there's no wax in there as well. Um, so that's this book, I would really recommend getting it because it's a really simple and effective handbook on how you can make your garden perfect for wildlife. It's beautifully illustrated. And it's a really great book, whether you are an experienced gardener or a novice. I'm not brilliant at gardening myself, but um, definitely with this, I'm going to be doing it a lot more. It's really fantastic. It's a great book. Makes it seem kind of easy and simple to do, which is really great. So I really recommend this, Rewild Your Garden by Francis Tophill. And if you're interested in hedgehogs, then I'd recommend the Hedgehog book. Now, this is a series of books um, which have come out, which are focused on lots of different... We'll move that in a little bit. Uh, which are focused on lots of different species. So there's, um, I think, one on bees and everything else. Um, the Hedgehog book is great because it's got everything you'd ever want to know about hedgehogs in it. And it was written by quite a good friend of mine. Um, it was written by Hugh Warwick, who is AKA Hedgehog Hugh. And you can find him on Twitter. He's kind of a the nation's hedgehog expert. And he does lots of really cool stuff with this with these um, animals as well. And it's got, you know, what is a hedgehog? So back to the basics, but also about their decline, about their cultural associations with us. Um, and how you can save them as well. Um, but anyway, I think, any more comments coming in? Um, I just wanted to thank you all so much for joining me for this live session about how to encourage more wild into your garden. I think it's a, a really kind of important thing to do. Or your, you know, your green spaces, if you don't have a garden, a balcony, even a windowsill, you can do something with it. You can um, plant something or do something a little bit different that's just gonna help boost the wildlife around you. Um, so yeah, that's it from me. I think I will wrap up now. Um, massive thank you for you all for watching. Um, spring, oh, Autumn Watch starts next week. Um, so if you'd like to watch some more wildlife uh, wildlife stuff, it's going to be really good. Autumn Watch starts on Tuesday. Um, I'll be joining the usual gang. We'll have Chris, we'll have Michaela, we'll have Yolo and Gillian. Um, and it's going to be uh, a really exciting series actually. It's on for two weeks 
this year instead of one. Normally Autumn Watch is on for one, but we've got two weeks, so there's going to be eight fantastic shows. It starts next Tuesday at 8pm. So, uh, yes, I hope you will join us then. It's a... Uh, it's going to be a really great series. I think you're going to love it. There's some amazing science and some amazing stories and, um, well, and some amazing footage as well. So anyway, thank you all very much for joining me. I hope you have a fantastic day. Enjoy your weekend and uh, I will see you very soon. Bye.